Thank you. And uh, releasing in uh, Australia right now is a documentary called Becoming Cousteau. And it's my great pleasure to be speaking to the editor and co-writer of the documentary Becoming Cousteau, Pax Wasserman. Pax, welcome to Movie Metropolis. Thanks for having me on. Great to talk to you. And uh, I'm so intrigued as to how you got involved with this documentary and writing it with uh, Mark Munro. Yeah, um, well, uh, Liz and I have moved in a lot of the same circles here in New York in the documentary world. And we had tried to get the stars to align for projects all along the way. Um, and it, things never really worked out in the past for lots of interesting projects. And so we felt finally we got things to work out for this to come together. Um, she called me about um, nine months or so before we started editing last March. And um, it was really, felt like really a perfect film also because it's, you know, it's, it was a fairly dark year um, already shaping up to be even then, even before COVID hit. And uh, it's nice to work on something that's a little more inspiring, um, even though we, we definitely uh, weighed in the muck a bit in this film. Uh -huh. Well, congratulations on it. It's such an informative and, uh, and really well uh, presented documentary. You have, obviously you had so much material to work on, uh, interviews, of course, and archival material, et cetera. Tell me about the challenges that you faced uh, together with Liz in putting it all together. Yeah, I mean, first uh, we knew we were gonna get a trove of material from the Cousteau Society that included release films, but also outtakes and um, interviews and all kinds of things. And there was a lot of things also available elsewhere that kind of continued to trickle in as we edited. But I think in the beginning, it was the challenge was really how much of his life should we tell? Should we limit it to um, just a, a certain period? Um, we did arrive um, at the conclusion that we needed to tell a story that had these two halves of a person who really changed over time, who kind of started as this adventurer um, that was really just following his nose with curiosity, um, seeing new things, showing them to the world, and then somebody who saw things on that journey um, and decided to let the rest of the world know about it. But also somebody who, you know, as we, we see in the film, um, was involved with oil exploration for a while and things that would be quite surprising for a lot of people who only know him as this great man, Cousteau. Um, and that was one of the things that really attracted me to working with Liz is that she had done a number of films before where she really went beneath the mythology of people that were well known for one thing and uh, a warts and all approach to make a more authentic hero that people can relate to as well as be inspired by. And that's what I found so interesting when you say warts and all about Jacques Cousteau, because uh, you don't flinch from talking about some of the uh, issues he had with his family uh, and with other things that he's uh, regretted being involved with. So that, that sets it apart, perhaps, from something that's purely positive look at a particular person. Yeah, there had been films before that were a little shorter that were made. There were celebrations that he produced of his first 75 years um, that was made by his, his family. And, and so those had a certain take, obviously. And then there was other things that were made. Um, there was a film on the BBC that had been more critical. So we were trying to find a way to do it all and be more of a definitive documentary that both celebrated him and, and, and got into the dirt a bit. Um, in terms of, yes, there's stuff with, with him with extramarital affairs and, and things that, um, but also um, with the early, uh, the death of Farg, that was an early, um, when he was really focused more at that point on, on promoting Aqualung. And um, there was always a lot of risk with what they were doing, but that's the other side of adventure is risk. Mm -hmm. So, you know, again, we really felt that if, for most people watching the film, because it's been a number of years since the shows were on and the films aren't even that available right now, that um, this would be their introduction to him. So we really wanted to make something that um, would be inspiring to younger people as well. And to show you somebody who, who uh, faced a really difficult task, um, wasn't particularly trained for it, even along the way of just whether it's inventing a way to go deeper because he wanted to see more, or how do I show my friends, let's invent a camera. Um, and then it became um, a person who's like, how can I use my celebrity to its greatest effect later on? But somebody who, who always made use of the tools at his, at his hand. 
um, and uh, did the most with it in the face of very difficult headwinds, much like we're facing today. Absolutely right. <laughs> Interesting to hear that. And, and there's two other components I really enjoyed about the documentary, which is, of course, the music, but also using Vincent Cassell to uh, read um, extracts and, and, and information, etc. cetera. Yeah, um, the music was Danny Benzi and Sandra Jurians, who had done um, a bunch of great scores, including the score for Ozark before just an enormous um, uh, tool shed they had to draw on in terms of, they have done so many different sounds um, and they're also really creative guys and really inspired. Um, and I mean, we are like over the moon about the score. I mean, we use a lot of music. I use a lot of music when I edit. Liz likes a lot of music. So, um, it, and uh, you know, obviously music is the number one way to let the audience know how you feel about what you're presenting. Um, it's the most direct way to do that. So like they were incredible partners in that. Um, Vincent Cassell was somebody, was our first name, always at the top of the list for this. Even though he does not sound like Jacques Cousteau, he has, he has a mixture of his quality. I mean, I don't know him very well personally, but um, his, his public persona has a mixture of this sort of boyish charm and also this but also this kind of, you know, turn towards a seriousness or, um, you know, a dark side. So, um, and Jeek was a lot of, Jeek is what Cousteau is known by, JYC Jeek. Um, and he was somebody who did um, have a really wide range of emotion. And, um, you know, I think even today, that would be something you'd be hearing a lot more from if he was out today, he would be discussed and, um, and um, impatience. I think. Um, so it was really wonderful to have um, somebody that could cover all the emotions like Vincent Cassell, amazing actor. Um, just a joy to have him do that voice. Okay, no, it's, it's great. Now you're a very experienced editor, uh, Pax, and uh, um, I, I'll, I want to talk to you about a couple of other things you've been involved with, but I wanted to ask you about editing becoming Cousteau, because with all of this source material that you had, all of uh, everything that you have access to, tell me about the editing, because obviously you have so much material and you have to make choices about what remains in and what goes out of the documentary. Tell me about those challenges. Well, in the beginning, the first priority was to find um, the largest uh, um, localities of footage where we could feel like we were living in the moment in his life. So the longest pieces that we had, sometimes they were things we rated his early short films. Sometimes there were outtakes and things like that. So we really, that was the first, we really put a premium on that in the beginning on how can we feel like we're with him, we're experiencing his discoveries with him for as much as possible. Um, and, you know, then it was a, a lot of questions of tone as well of like, where do, you know, just picking one idea for where we want to be with, when we're first setting out on the Calypso, where do we want to be when they're first making that, uh, the silent world? I mean, there's always a lot of things going on. There's science going on, there's discovery, there's risk, there's all these different things. So. Um, I think it was really like finding in the beginning the places where um, we could feel like we're telling a first person story. Um, and then as it went on, um, it was an, another question of balance in terms of how we could ride um, a bit of a roller coaster of conscience as we go through that there could be these, these sort of sugar highs to his life. And then these more um, drawn out reflective moments like when he talks about his flaws. Um, so I think we, we ended up working on the first two thirds of the movie, the first two acts for a really long time. And we had not dipped into the third act, which is really his turn towards conservation. And, you know, that's the movie that I think most people probably think they're gonna see all the way through is that, is that great man movie. Um, and we were really drawn to the first two thirds. And then we were getting a little bit worried for a while, like we hadn't given ourselves enough time to, uh, crack the final third and we definitely had some trial and error with it but it actually came together pretty quick um, luckily for that and there was also challenges with again how to weave in the darker moments of his life um, you know his son's death his wife's death um, 
in, you know, an, an affair that grew into a marriage with, with Francine, mm -hmm. but that had to be handled a certain way. He was still married at the time, uh, as well as the oil involvement, the death of the, the early diver Farg. So there was a lot of like a sort of charging in a direction and then how do we recover from that and, and, and redirect and not just be lurching from one tone to another in that way. Um, and uh, Mark Monroe was the co-writer on this as well. Um, and we, we had many great talks about how to kind of sculpt his, his adventure, but also our, our growing understanding of who he is and to keep some distance as well. Okay, well, well done on that because it's, uh, I could imagine there would have been a number of assemblies of the, uh, the final edit before you made the decision about the, uh, the final release version. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I mean, that, that was the last hurdle was, um, you know, we got screeners of these things, but there are a lot of them were just scans off of 16 millimeter that where you, the, it's scanned with the frame edges and everything. So it's a very small image that you blow up and you don't know what you're gonna get. You don't know it's gonna be sharp. You don't know about quality. So um, we edited for about nine to 10 months be, from start to lock, I'd say maybe a bit more. And then it was another five to six months of just making sure we could actually get the best quality of that master, um, be it from beta cam, scan negative, wherever it's coming from. So basically, can we have the movie be locked? Um, or what do we have to change? So we did have to change things. And even as it's screened at various festivals, um, starting with Telluride Film Festival, we've had different versions that have had newer masters going in and finally getting it to a, um, a, you know, touch up all those old negatives, get the scratches out, get the dust out um, as much as possible. Because people today are used to seeing a very high level of um, underwater imagery. Yeah. It's very hard to compete. It's, it's amazing and it is to sort of keep nudging the audience and, you know, letting them know, hey, this is the first time anybody shot this. It, it doesn't compare to their screensaver on their, uh, on their home <laughs> computer. So it's like, how do you keep that sense of wonder and mystery alive and, uh, you know, and not just um, at a lower resolution than what's available now? Oh, well, congratulations on that because it does it does look great, and uh, uh, and it it is releasing in Australia now. But I'm wondering the reactions that you've had to becoming Cousteau uh, at film festivals elsewhere. Um, it's been really really good so far. I mean, I think people need a little bit of counter programming in this time. Um, so I think we're looking for another way to kind of think about our own time as well. Um, so I think it's kind of hitting a sweet spot for some people in that it's it's a story that diverts them, but that ultimately brings them back to the moment we're facing now, which is, you know, pretty dire global warming climate change situation that he talked about back then, but that, um, you know, I think it, it allows people to kind of go on a little car ride and end up back at their house, I guess, in a way. <laughs> something like that. So um, that's been a lot of reaction. So, um, and it's, you know, we definitely wanted to make a film that would appeal, like I said, to younger people, to our kids. Um, and though there are some darker parts to it, um, at times it is a film that everyone in the family can see and appreciate for different reasons, whether it's somebody who's older who remembers watching the shows as a kid or somebody who just heard of Jacques Cousteau and thinks he's some interesting old dude. Um, we talked about the city. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, a broad, okay. broad appeal there. Broad appeal. Yeah, no, no that's great. I, I'm so interested in your filmography, um, Pax, because you, you, I, I know you've received five uh, Emmy nominations, including for Cartel Land, which uh, it was such an impressive uh, documentary. Uh, what, what are the challenges that you face in choosing what you decide to edit and your process? Um, I mean, I like to work sort of like 50-50 between working with people I've worked with before and then working with new filmmakers, working with a lot of younger filmmakers as well. Uh, like when I worked with Matt, he'd only made one film, be well, two films before that. Um, but he was a pretty, pretty new filmmaker at that point, Matt Heinemann on Cartel N. Um, so the energy that comes from young people, it's like a young affair. It's like, it's amazing energy that you get from there. You, they're, they've been waiting their whole story to tell the whole life to tell these stories. So um, it's really invigorating for somebody who's done this like me for over 30 years. Um, so it's kind of a mixture of those two things. A lot of times I do react to the moment 
sometimes I don't necessarily make the best choice in that respect of, um, you know, chasing after something that I'm already can sort of consumed with in my own personal life or in political life or something like that, where you end up kind of going down a rabbit hole, um, which is actually one of the reasons I was drawn to Cousteau was it wasn't what I was thinking about already. Um, so I think that's a good marriage. I do work on a lot of really dark stuff, um, but um, I think as an overall, right now I'm directing a show called Couples Therapy for Showtime. And um, in just thinking about that show as well, that like, I feel like everything I've worked on has been about uh, modeling behavior, whether it's uh, positive or negative models for behavior. And that's a lot of what's happening in documentary is that you don't need to take it literally. It's, it isn't journalism in that way. It's storytelling for a purpose that's to, yes, inspire people, but also for people to relate to it in a number of ways. So you're either modeling a behavior that you want to emulate or don't be like that guy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that kind of thing. Very good. And, and you've been involved with a few narrative films as well. I mean, I've read that you're involved with Uli's Gold, for example, which I remember. But in particular, you worked with uh, Peter Bogdanovich for She's Funny That Way, a film I remember from, uh, oh, must be about, what, seven years ago or something like that. Yeah. And there's a new director's cut coming out of that um, being put together right now. So, which was a slightly different, it was a lot of changes along the way as there is with every fiction film. So um, the final film that came out um, it sort of became a look back from one of the main characters of an interview that she was having um, with a reporter and her looking back and sort of framing the whole story in the past. Whereas the, the director's cut is gonna be all more present tense um, the whole time and, and a, lot more, a lot more scenes, a lot more of the supporting characters that were originally in that. So it would be nice to see that come out. Okay. Yeah. Editing is, is a real art. And, and I know about Thelma Schoonmaker, of course, that I've spoken with Jill Bilcock. Um, oh. Yeah, so tell me about, is there a particular strategy or approach that being a good editor needs to adopt to be able to work on film? I mean, it helps to be a little OCD, I would say. Um, but OCD in, in um, I think particularly in, in working on verite films is you're always looking for that moment that's really telling. So it's not necessarily about the sort of alpha bite or the thing that really stands out in a scene that's an obvious thing, but some, you're always looking for like a small moment to hinge it around where that could be revealing. It's a lot of times it's nonverbal. Um, so I think for me, I'm always kind of, it's a mixture of keeping like, um, a meta structure in mind, but then have a good idea of where you're driving, but then lose yourself along the way. So it's like, I know I'm going to this town, but I'm going to take a variety of roads to get there. And I'm going to look at the pretty, um, butterflies on the way. I mean, that's, I worked with, um, DA Pennebaker on his last film as an editor. And that's really something like he was really about chasing butterflies. That really was something that was really inspiring about him. That he was always, there's always time to let your camera follow something that you weren't, didn't put yourself in place for. Um, so I think that's something that in editing as well is, is it helps to have, it's a left brain, right brain thing. But for me, um, you know, I start out, I review the footage, get an idea of basically what I suggested the director that we should do with the film in terms of the documentary, especially. And then I'm sort of freed from that for a while. And then you can go into scene work um, and you know why you're in the room, but there's a lot of ways to get in and out of that room. Um, yeah, so I think that applies. I, I definitely don't do as much fiction as I do doc. So I can't speak to fiction. I think one of the difference I have found with fiction and doc is that you rarely have enough time with like, by the time you feel like you've got a good film with doc, you maybe have a couple weeks to a month left. <laughs> you're right near the end. You just run out of time with, with fiction you get to that point where you've got a film together and then you're halfway through your process and it's about perfection, perfection and just noodling. And sometimes you get that, that luxury with docs. I mean, we had a little bit more of a longer schedule on this one, um, but yeah, usually it is. It's like you're gunning for a festival and you just get it in shape and, it, and you feel that thrill of that moment. And then maybe you've got another month, month and a half or something like that, um, which is exciting, but uh, 
you know, 10 minutes, much more. It is. It's it's quite a process. Look, great talking to you, Pax. Last yeah. question I, I, I wanted to ask you, um, apart from your own films, of course, is do you have an exemplar of uh, either a narrative or a documentary that you would hold up as being a perfect edit? Um, hmm. I mean, one of my favourite documentaries is probably Grizzly Man. Um, the Werner Herzog film. I think that was a pretty amazing doc, doc in terms of telling a story, giving Werner Herzog a place in that story as well, but not as big as in other films. Sometimes it's too much, um, but in letting the film grow beyond that story that was being told um, to our relationship to, to nature and are, what are we and are we animals? Um, so I thought that was, that was one of my favorite documentaries, I'd say. Um, I, I really like the act of killing as well, just in terms of pushing the form. I thought that was a pretty amazing film and a really interesting way to sort of understand, even though it's not about the Nazis, but it helped me understand the Nazis from like a different vantage point. Um, so dark stuff, I guess, I'm making darker <laughs> films. Uh, then again, I also like, um, Gleaners and I by Agnes Varda. I love that film. Um, you know, this just documentary is just exploding. As you know, right now, there's so many different ways to go at it. There's so many hybrid docs. Um, I also like Robert Greene's films as well. Um, so it's, it's broader than, it's bigger than fiction right now, it feels like. I mean, it's just so many different ways to, to make a statement. A lot of people want to become fiction directors. So they're kind of on their way through the room, but, um, yeah, I think it's um, it's exciting to be part of it right now. There's just so many good films out there. There are, and yours included. And we've been speaking to Pax Wasserman, the director and uh, the editor, I should say, and co-writer of Becoming Cousteau, which is now on release in uh, Australian cinemas. Thank you so much, Pax, for talking with me. Thank you so much, Peter.